Yes, hello everybody. My name is Eunice Manton, and today I'm going to be talking to you about unprivileged CRIU. That is to say, being able to run CRIU without requiring root privileges. Um, a little bit about myself, I work on OpenJ9, which is an open source uh, JVM. And recently you may have noticed that JVM folks have been very interested in CRIU. Uh, we've been lurking on your mailing lists and in your channels. Um, and if we have some time, I'll talk a little bit about why uh, that is, uh, the problems that we have and how we think that uh, CRIU can help us. Um, so the talk is divided into two sections. I'll start off uh, by talking about uh, the problem at hand, uh, which is running CRU without requiring root, uh, the current state of the work, uh, and, and where we are in the development process. Uh, and then later on, given some time, uh, I'll talk about our specific JVM startup uh, issues and the motivations and challenges that we have. Uh, so just fair warning, uh, I don't consider myself to be a Linux expert by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I don't even consider myself to be extremely knowledgeable. Uh, I think I know enough to be useful, uh, and um, I'm certainly open to uh, comments, suggestions, and constructive criticism, so uh, please don't be shy. Uh, so let's talk about uh, CRU. Um, essentially, uh, this work involves allowing uh, CRIU to dump and restore a subset of programs uh, without requiring uh, root. Um, essentially, this is done uh, with uh, using the capabilities uh, subsystem, primarily uh, using CAP checkpoint restore, uh, which was added recently, not, not so recently now, uh, to the kernel to kind of plug the gaps of what was missing uh, to be a, to to allow CRE to do this, uh, and the idea is uh, simple idea is, is that you set this cap on your executable, uh, run with dash dash unprivileged, and hopefully you can dump and restore some, but not all programs. Um, some things simply can't be done uh, without root uh, in the current state of affairs. Uh, so my approach has been to. Uh, first, try it as root. Uh, if it doesn't work as root, it's not probably not going to work uh, in unprivileged. Uh, if it works as root, uh, then you can go on and, and try to figure out uh, if it works uh, without root, uh, if you can get it to work, uh, if you have to modify things. Um, but that, that, that's been my general approach to this problem. Uh, so the original patch set uh, was opened uh, in mid-2020. Uh, that's about two years now. Um, uh, the original work was done by Adrian Reber uh, and Nicholas Vieno. Uh, I don't know if they're in the room today. Wonderful. Yeah, good to meet you. Um, so the original work was done by uh, Adrian and Nicholas. And uh, as I said, it needs cap checkpoint restore. Uh, the current set of patches can work with cap sysadmin uh, as a substitute. Um, one of the questions is maybe um, we don't need that right now. Uh, certainly two years ago when the work started, cap checkpoint restore wasn't uh, everywhere where we needed it to be. And uh, using cap sysadmin uh, was a way to kind of get this testing going. Um, uh, but maybe it's time to, to revisit whether that's a good idea or not. Um, and one of the things I didn't appreciate about this when I first started looking at this is that cap checkpoint restore in and of itself isn't enough. Uh, to, to do everything that CRIU needs. Uh, it really just provides access to the things that weren't already provided by other CAPs. So you kind of need a, a constellation of CAPs, and, and it depends on your program and, and the internals of what your program does and what needs to be saved and restored. Um, certainly that, that didn't occur to me uh, when I first started. I just figured cap checkpoint restore give yourself that and you know you're good to go uh, but the reality is that that you you try with cap checkpoint restore you fail you look at the log you see uh, you, know, you know why it failed and what other caps you need to uh to have to be able to um dump and restore your specific program uh, so some of the other caps that you may need 
uh, are, are listed here. Uh, CISP trace is fairly important. Um, net admin, um, also fairly important. Uh, the other ones uh, I've been able to get away without needing, but uh, they vary on a case by case basis. Uh, so the current patch set um, is uh, was opened about a couple of months ago, actually, uh, by myself. And um, essentially, I, I, I'm going to admit I didn't really do too much heavy lifting. The, the credit goes to uh, Adrian. Uh, I simply just rebased uh, the patches, fixed a, a few things here and there, and um, more or less continued uh, what Adrian started. Uh, the only significant thing I've, I've added here is uh, RPC and libcru support uh, for unprivileged, uh, primarily because that's what we use. Uh, so we kind of needed that part uh, and uh, made some changes to the way the current DAT works. Um, I probably don't need to to refresh anybody uh, anybody's memory in the room about what this is, but uh, for anybody else who, who might be uh, listening to this uh, in to CRIU, uh, to some of my JVM colleagues. Uh, the current app is basically a cache file uh, that represents uh, everything that CRIU knows about the currently running kernel. Uh, and um, essentially, you, you need that to be up to date with the currently running kernel. Uh, and if, if there's a reboot, potentially the, the kernel changes and you have to, to, to figure out whether your cache file is stale or not. Uh, the cache file is kept on slash run, and that has the convenient feature that it's a tempfs uh, file system, and it, it goes away when the machine gets rebooted. So you don't, we don't really have to, to worry about uh, uh, whether the current death is stale or not. It, it goes away, and we rebuild. Um, in, in the original patch set that Adrian worked on, uh, the user does not have uh, right access to uh, slash run. So there needed to be an alternative. Um, in the original patch set, uh, the current data was stored uh, in the home directory, uh, persistent, uh, and then you kind of have to worry about uh, whether or not it matches the currently running kernel. Uh, so Adrian suggested that maybe uh, XGD runtime directory, uh, which is also a tempfs, would be a good alternative. And uh, that maintains the behavior uh, with root CRIU that it the, the file just goes away, and uh, we don't have problems like that anymore. Uh, so all I did was was implement that uh, really straightforward. Uh, so having said that, uh, there are still a fair number of unresolved questions. Um, I've gone through the pull requests uh, and read all the comments to try to figure out uh, what thoughts people put forward that, that may not have been answered, uh, any kind of um, uh, unresolved questions and, and things that, that were brought up that maybe deserve an answer. Uh, some of these may not be relevant anymore. Um, but the reason I bring them up here is uh, I'm hoping that by bringing them up, uh, people may, uh, it may jog uh, people's memories and, and if they have some fresh insights into these questions, I'd certainly uh, appreciate hearing them, uh, or if they're, if, if they're not relevant anymore, um, plus that as well. Um, I don't think I'm gonna go through all of them, um, a couple of them, um, or maybe in passing. Uh, the first one, uh, what do we do with a uh, cheer-rooted process currently? Um, if we don't have the capabilities to restore the, the true root, we simply uh, pretend that we did and go on. That may or may not lead to, to failures. Is that the right behavior? No. Um, answer to that. Uh, second, uh, what do we want the default non-root behavior to be? If you invoke CRU as non-root, do we want to just assume that, that you want unprivileged? Do we want to be explicit and require you to pass dash dash unprivileged? Uh, I mean, kind of go either way. Um, if this was a, a regular program, it, it probably would make sense to say, you know, um, if you're running as non-root, maybe we should just default to, to non-root. 
uh, behavior, unprivileged behavior, and, and kind of skip all the things that we can't do or we know that we can't do. Uh, the problem with that is that you may successfully restore a program in a way that 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 is kind of subtly broken. You you got to this you got to the end of the restore pro, uh, process. The program is back. The process is running. You didn't restore some parts. You know, did, did you skip something important? Is your is the is the program actually in a safe state, or is you know is you know are, are there dragons lurking? Or you know, is your database going to be corrupted an hour or a day from now or something like that? So um, certainly, that that sort of behavior uh, is, is something that we need to to address. And the following points all kind of stem from that uh, idea. Uh, do we avoid things, uh, doing things that we know are going to fail? We know, we know that we're non root. We know what capabilities we have. We know, you know, the thing that we're doing, whether it's going to succeed or not, do we avoid it? Do we just jump over it? Do we perform it and, and fail? Um, again, that goes back to, to, we don't want to restore a process in a, in a broken state. Uh, and I think it may be better to have the user know that up front. Uh, uh, Go right ahead. Yeah. If we have any questions, just jump right in. We have the mic? Uh, yeah. I want to say, sorry, is that actually, uh, so I worked on the initial rootless stuff for run C as well as for Moji, which is like an image based tool. And so in both cases, I had to come up, I had to deal with the exact same question about, uh, should this be automatic or not? Uh, I don't know if the same holds true for, for Kriu. It depends on what the threat model is and how much you care about certain things. Uh, but basically for run C, where we have the ability to say, we will fail if any aspect does not work effectively. So basically there is a config U, which is like a JSON file that is like basically the entire description of the container. And if we can do it, then we'll do it. And if we can't, we can't, is the way that we do it for run C. Mochi, that's not possible because if you need to, uh, uh, for unpacking a container image, you need to like uh, fake a bunch of stuff and so on and so on. And there's not really a way to like, uh, basically no container image could be unpacked if you if you would fail at any point when nothing would work, right? And so for Mochi, you have to specify it. So I guess uh, my view, I don't know if it's the same for career folks, but having having done this and it's very, very annoying because it's like, I want it to work. I don't want people to worry about it. Um, but I guess it depends on the security model, but career folks are better than me. Yeah, certainly a, a good point. Um, yeah, anyway, that's so. that's definitely the hard, hard question. I'm also unsure about it. I think um, it, it would make more, make more sense if it actually fails. If you if you not restore, then providing an uh, up restored program. I, I don't know if, if that's if that's really helpful in in, in this case. So Andre yeah. probably has. Um. With this unprivileged option, it was my idea to add it because my idea. Okay. Uh, so, Crew is a low level tool, and we want to be sure that users that use Crew understand what they are doing. I mean, we can understand that we, we are running like unprivileged, and we, we need to add some work around for some specific cases, but actually, we we want to get approval from the users that we understand what's going on, that it will be not exact restore, but it will be unprivileged restore with some, that's with some. Yeah, that's, that's so, a very, very good. Uh, one more comment for me. I am very sorry that I slow on reviewing this stuff. <laughs> so I go push my, myself harder to. It's not a, not a problem. I think we are, we are very, close to merge this pull request and work. About your root, this is one specific case that I, I don't like. <clears throat> uh, I mean, the idea that we see right now, we try to do your root. If it fails, we just exit and say, okay, this is unprivileged mode. We exit without any uh, error. We, we don't notify the, the mod that, that root that we fail to do this. But actually, we, we call true root for some reason. And if we exit without any error, if we don't handle this case in, in, in the code that 
mean that we will probably fail in some other cases. Yeah. Or we will do something wrong and we will, we will not know about this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so we need to find a way how to handle this part properly. Uh, but do you mean if if you have the unprivileged option, then it should just continue to work even if it's not able to restore everything? I'm, I'm not sure. So um, with the unprivileged no, no, option... No, no, I, I don't want to say this. I mean, we need to handle each specific case and just try to find out what, what is acceptable for in each case. But we, we can't just say, okay, Chirut doesn't work in unprivileged and just exit with zero and say. Yeah, right, right, yeah, that's, that's, that's. And by the way, we have one more problem with unprivileged. Uh, it doesn't work well inside user spaces. Because we have a few places where we require global capabilities. For example, it's a page map. We read page map to do the memory dump find zero pages to find all pages and all this. So we need to look at this part. Certainly, certainly. Um, so yeah, a lot of the remaining unresolved questions kind of center around, uh, around what to do in, in these sorts of uh, tricky situations. Um, we, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, we, uh, we talked about this. Um, do we want Creo to work from inside user namespaces? Like, it's, it's, I'm honestly asking, I'm not uh, implying we shouldn't. The short answer, we won't work from user namespaces because, for, for example, in this use case with Java, we want to support it inside containers, unprivileged containers, all kinds of containers. Ah, okay, you really want this to, uh, we want to, okay. Yeah, but I don't know how to handle this page map because there are some security issues. Yeah. I mean, ho hopefully, like some Small of those privileged them and running on the host started by system D at boot up. I'm okay, like, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, some of those cases will be easier than others because, like, obviously, running Creo inside a user namespace, which is then running something, say, Docker in it, going to have a very a day uh, because you're going to have also the, the mix then of potentially nested LSMs and all of that stuff combined with the fact that you're inside of a user namespace that also restricts what you can do and restore. And for something simpler, say, like, a, I mean, not calling a JVM to be particularly simple, but as far as process, process trees go, it is. Um, that it, just case makes is, sense. is there any approach or idea, maybe even from the MM folks, uh, with respect to page map and uh, privileges? I don't remember the details. We discussed this, I don't know, maybe five or seven years ago. So we need to check this discussion and find out what, what was security and so how we can solve that. Creo seems imp uh, seems important enough that we can, you know, have functionality in the kernel that is Creo specific. It's not a new thing, right? Yeah, that's right. But someone he, to, do the to work. make this. <laughs> yeah. I think we're about only halfway through your slides, so I guess uh, that's uh, it. Yeah, I can um, quickly summarize. I think we've segued into uh, nicely into I can quickly go through, which is our actual problems in, in Java and why we are trying to use uh, Creo. Uh, and to, to summarize a long story uh, very quickly, we, we want better startup. The, the JVM. Uh, is for for many many reasons very slow to start up. Um, people who are writing uh, microservices in, in cloud environments, uh, they care about startup, and uh, the, the philosophy in the microservices world is actually very similar to the Unix philosophy of of having very small programs that that do things well and kind of chaining them together, piping them together to do something large. And you can imagine if if your greps and your seds and your ox took 100 times longer to start, uh, you know, 
it, people wouldn't tolerate that sort of thing. So that, that that's kind of what's driving uh, people to want faster JVM startup. They're writing small programs to try to, to manage large, complicated applications, uh, but the JVM doesn't start up very quickly. Um, some of our traditional ways of, of uh, gaining performance, JIT compilation, AOT compilation, uh, can only help so much, and sometimes they, they conflict with fast startup. JIT compiler is running right beside the application, uh, taking resources. AOT compiler can't see everything, can't produce uh, the, the same quality of code, uh, and, and the Java language model makes that all difficult. So long story short, JVM slow to start up. Um, and so so we're really we're trying to use CRIE to kind of to plug that gap, to, to start a JVM, uh, save its state at a certain point and, and be able to restore it quickly. And the, the fundamental problem with that is that restoring a process is not like starting a new process, uh, especially from the user's perspective, right? A uh, user expects certain things uh, and the unprivileged CRE addresses one of those things. People don't expect or want to run their JVMs as root uh, you know, uh, program managers and sysadmins get very nervous if you tell them that you have to run their JVM stack uh, and as root. Um, so that that's kind of what brought me to to this work. Uh, but other things are also uh, at play here in that users expect when they start their program uh, to be able to to specify new environment variables, new command lines, and when you restore a program, obviously that that doesn't work um, and that, that they have consternation with that uh, um, with, with that limitation. Um, uh, people who are using Preu to do process migration, they, they come from the mindset that, that that they're aware that the process is being migrated. They know they probably can't change the kernel. They, they want to keep their user space consistent. People who are, are, are starting a new process don't think like that. Right? No, nobody really thinks like that. So using CRIU as a sort of startup accelerator uh, imposes limitations that the people are not used to. Uh, and we kind of have to massage that and, and you know, uh, change their expectations a little bit uh, and maybe uh, um, address them a little bit and kind of there's a push and pull there. Um, so I think that that's kind of what is driving the, the challenges in this space. Hopefully, um, you a little bit of understanding of what are, why why we're here. Um, certainly, uh, using CRIU is not the only way to solve this, but the reality is that most JVM code bases are, are monolithic, very large, and, and very difficult. It's very difficult to do a paradigm shift. Very difficult to take a JVM and, and do complete static ahead of time compilation, um, you know, simply difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a difficult thing to do. And CRIU allows us to, to kind of accomplish some of our goals in, in a much easier way. So um, got some backup slides here that we don't have to go through about how we use CRIU. You're welcome to, to look at them. Um, I believe that brings me to my end, end of my time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think, um, sorry. Let's have a clapping first. <laughs>